This programming is sponsored by the Bayou Theater at the University of Houston Clear Lake, announcing their new season, featuring a variety of music, dance, theater, and comedy performances. Tickets at uhcl.universitytickets.com. I see you. Remember Walter Cronkite, Dan Rather, Peter Jennings? Well, critics believe those once trusted voices of news will be replaced by a younger, fresher, more diverse journalism. But with information so readily available, what do you think the future of journalism looks like? As a consumer of media, how do you know that the person that you're tuned into is really on the up and up? I'm Eddie Robinson. Stay tuned as ICU explores media literacy. Is journalism losing its objectivity with the threat of misinformation? spread of, quote, fake news. We'll chat with acclaimed author and professor of media and film at Howard University, Sonia Williams, as well as award-winning reporter Justin Carter, who left his TV job to focus on a new digital career in multimedia. Oh yeah, I feel you. We hear you. I see you. I see you. I'm Eddie Robinson. She's an award-winning radio producer and renowned author who's a media professor at Howard University. She's also worked as a broadcast journalist and media trainer in the Caribbean, Africa, and throughout the United States. And we're so fortunate to connect with her virtually from Washington, D.C. Please welcome Professor Sonia D. Williams. Thank you so much, ma'am, for being a special guest on I See You. Thank you, Eddie. Yeah, I'd like to start this conversation by asking what comes to your mind when you think about the future of journalism? You know, where do you think this field of study or industry, depending on how you look at it, what do you think the future of journalism will look like? When we're talking about when I got into the industry in the 70s, there were prescribed avenues that you could go into. Either you were going to be a broadcast journalist, whether radio or television, or you would go into print media. Internet, as we know it today, didn't exist (laughs) in terms of dissemination of information. I know when I finished my undergraduate degree, I knew that I wanted to work in radio, but I also thought that I wanted to work in uh, places like AP, uh, Associated Press, or United Press International. But I ended up, my first job was at a public radio station in, of all places, Cedar Falls, Iowa. (laughs) <laughs> you know, I was part of the, the whole uh, idea that you go off to the quote-unquote boonies or to a smaller market, you get experience, you, you know, cover the city council and the local school districts and all that. And then once you have cut your teeth there, you move into the bigger markets, if that's your desire. <laughs> now, I think that at Howard, we're educating students who say, Right up at front, I want to be an anchor. So I want to go to New York or L.A. or Chicago Mm -hmm. (laughs) or Mm -hmm. Houston, Mm -hmm. some major city and major media market and start right there. So I think that the expectation with the number and the types of various news organizations and outlets for disseminating news, there's a lot more opportunity. However, I think that that's on the surface because if you look at who owns the media (laughs) then you're getting into well is it really different (laughs) or do you have a different name for uh, an organization that is really an affiliation of something else so in terms of where journalism is heading there's something now and i don't think it's that new because you could go back to the 30s and talk about advocacy journalism which is something that someone like Ida B. Wells did in terms of of exposing what was going on with African-American people throughout the country in terms of lynching and discrimination and segregation. You know, now the uh, one of the buzzwords in the industry is solutions journalism, not just reporting what's out there and what's happening in the world, 
But also, what are some of the possible solutions to issues like crime or discrimination or whatever? So in terms of where journalism is going, I think it's still trying to figure that out. (laughs) I don't care whether it's broadcast, whether it's totally web-based. It's 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 something that I think we're all grappling with, whether those of us who teach, those of us who are in the industry um, in terms of professionals or people who consume the media and journalism. So I think it's kind of wide open. Are we now turning more to independent mediators, which I'd like to call them, or, you know, those who are influencers, sometimes connected to news organizations, but they're like these do-it-yourself podcasters or individuals who have a strong opinion and they feel led to create their own spaces of media in hopes of developing their own audiences that could help them make a living out of this. Is that a good thing for media and journalism? Yes, and I think that in terms of whether it's a good thing, it is and it isn't. (laughs) It is in terms of the fact that now you have, given that the technology has enabled people in their homes to sit down in front of their phones (laughs) to then present information that could never have happened in the past or it would have been really difficult because once you decide what the information is going to be then the next question is how do you get it out to the world right well with the internet that's really really pretty easy (laughs) and so like you said you have these independent non-affiliated to um, a major organization producers and reporters and content creators right creators who have now access that, you know, they would never have had, say, 50 years ago or even 20 years ago. That's good because, again, you have a diversity of voices. What's difficult, and I tell my students all the time, is that you can get online and create, you know, your own podcast or, you know, even develop your own website and then, you know, get that out in the world. But how is anybody going to know that that exists? You know, how do you publicize the fact that you're doing this on a regular basis? The other thing is that as a consumer of media and of journalism, how do you know that the person that you're tuned into (laughs) is really on the up and up or or is telling you information or presenting information that is viable? So, you know, one of the things we do at Howard in in my department is we have a course that is absolutely required called media literacy. And students have to take that as an entry level course. And it really looks at how do we not only consume media, what is media first? How do you consume it? And what are the forces that influence it? Uh, So that students don't just say, well, I saw it on XYZ website or I heard it on this station or whatever and take that as the gospel. You know, you go kind of go back to the basics of research in that you, you can look at a source and say, okay, I heard or I read on the internet that X and X and X happened. Okay, that's fine. But where's that information really coming from? Who's behind that information? That's right. And if you want to make sure that it, it's actually viable or true, You probably need to do what we, you know, I'm sure that you did in in graduate school, but it's really a simple thing. Find other sources and then triangulate, compare. Correct. We all have powers of reasoning. So (laughs) what really does make sense? I'm sure that, you know, you, as I have seen something on the Internet and said, oh, my goodness. And then you retweet it or send it to your friends and family. And then you find out (laughs) down the road, oh, no, that was totally false. (laughs) So it does mean, I think, for the future, we talk about all of the various sources that are available today. I think there will be even more because individuals will be able to get into the dissemination business, so to speak. But it does mean that both as consumers and as producers, we have to be more discerning. What are we looking at? You know, back in the early days of radio and television, you know, especially in terms of radio and TV, there were, what, three major networks and then a couple of independent network sources three channels and that's really. where you <laughs> found TV. your information on the on the print side you know there were 
many, many newspapers. Of course, that dwindled down <laughs> as the finances affected what newspapers could stay in business. You had a, a ton of magazines. Even the magazines have now, many of the magazines have, have gone by the wayside. That's gone digital. And yet in its place, you have these digital sources that um, either have migrated into the digital world from the print world or from the broadcast world, or they're brand new. And so, so the thing is you have almost a, a wealth of information how do you figure out what is viable and what's not? The other thing is that we talked about broadcasting, you know, in in the day. Yeah. And we still talk about that for the most part. But I think, you know, if you look at the younger generation now, when they look at a screen, it's not, oh, this was on CBS broadcast. But they're looking at it on the screen. So they, is it broadcast? Did it originate on a webcast? You know, who knows? Who knows? <laughs> So I think that the broadcast slash print universe that used to be pretty large has really kind of become more segmented. That's true. And so I think it's going to be even more of a chore and a task for consumers as well as producers, content producers, to figure out how to reach a broader audience so that we don't go from the broadcast model to this really segmented narrow casting that I think we are in right now. Coming up, more with media and film professor Sonia Williams of Howard University. And we'll also have an unguarded conversation with Justin Carter. He's an Emmy Award winning investigative reporter who left his TV job in Illinois now has transitioned into digital media, and he openly admits to ICU that he was scared for leaving a solid career in TV news. He's now working for The Shade Room, an entertainment news and gossip site. Find out why he decided to make this move and what he believes his future will look like. I'm Eddie Robinson. I See You will return in just a moment. It's I See You. I'm Eddie Robinson, and we're speaking with Sonia Williams, author and Peabody Award-winning radio producer, as well as professor of media and film over at Howard University. My curiosity about journalism started in the late 90s when I pursued a graduate degree at uh, New York University in media ecology. And I discovered in this class, one of the classes that I had taken, I had an opportunity to take a class under author professor Neil Postman uh, before he died. And he wrote this book called Amusing Ourselves to Death. And in it, he predicted, you know, all of this all-consuming media culture of glitz, gossip, and greed. And I kind of want to get some insight from you as to whether or not what you think about all of that. Fast forward, October of this past year, we had this email exchange uh, with the, with this ESPN insider, Adam Schefter, and former Washington football team president, Bruce Allen. Schefter um, basically sent an entire draft of a story he had slated to, was slated to publish for ESPN to the team's president, calling him Mr. Editor, the whole thing. So who knows how long that had been going on, that relationship. But this exchange was exposed because of documents and emails that had been generated by an investigation into a former Raiders coach. Gruden's sudden exit coming hours after a New York Times report detailed emails he wrote over the course of nearly a decade that included sexist, racist, and homophobic language. So aimed at various it parties. brought all these questions in my mind about access and access journalism and accountability. You know, and I'm torn. Is media and media journalism morphing into this entertainment lust 
that one wants a story first so bad that they run the risk of integrity in order to gain prestige with the source? You know, are we sacrificing objectivity, perhaps even integrity, challenging local authorities, building investigative reporting? You know, where'd that go? Is media becoming more attached to the glitz and the glamour? You know, there's a line in the Scarface film, those guys want it all. The chicas, champagne, flash. <laughs> chicas, champagne. You know, flash. is that what consumers find interesting right now in this day and age, uh, Professor? Because I'm just curious as to, you know, whether or not that alone, this entertainment kind of bug, is really attracting consumers nowadays. Oh, yes, definitely. I think that's absolutely the case. And I don't think it's becoming. It has become. But, you know, part of that is also feeding the beast. And by that, I mean that now that you have these 24-hour news networks and, and programs, what do you put on there? <laughs> you know, and, and it's not to say that entertainment is the only thing. I think it's entertainment and opinion as information. My opinion does not necessarily mean that that's the actual truth. But yet you have whole networks that are based on having a panel or two or three people sitting and talking for an hour or two yeah. about what they think, <laughs> as opposed to what might in fact be the fact. And on the entertainment side, yes, I think that Americans, people in general, love to find out about what's going on in, in the entertainment field, in sports, in non-hard news kind of areas whether or not that is actually helping to feed what we know needs to happen in information uh, in general is one thing i think there needs to be a balance clearly what happens in the music industry what happens in the entertainment industry in general <laughs> is fascinating and some of it is obviously groundbreaking what happens though in the political world what happens in education what happens in criminal justice, the system there, I think is, is as important, if not more important, because it obviously underpins the whole society. So th there needs to be a balance, but clearly entertainment yeah. <laughs> has yeah. become, I don't want to say king, but it is definitely what attracts people than other kinds of stories. Yeah. This whole thing about CRT, you... I, I would imagine you know, but I definitely know that as an elementary school student, as a junior high school student, <laughs> and even as a high school student, like what? <laughs> Heck to the no, that would not, it didn't exist, it doesn't exist. This kind of thing, no, this is really a college and graduate school study. And it's not something that it's being what is being made out to be that oh they're going to teach the kids to hate whatever <laughs> yeah 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 so yeah i think you know there has to be uh, more of a balance and you mentioned something about um mm -hmm. investigative journalism yeah 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 the thing about investigative journalism just like the thing about the thing that i've done now i was never a, a day to day go out and you have this hard deadline that did not feed my soul Interesting. but but what did was feature stories that took a lot longer to write or to uh, produce for radio where I could spend a half an hour or an hour exploring a particular topic yes and that kind of thing takes a lot more effort and money and resources than you know, going out and doing a, a couple of interviews on the street or interviewing, you know, a celebrity or a, Correct. A opinion maker and then putting that together for two minutes or, you know, a five minute piece. So I think that in terms of investigative reporting, if you look at places, the biggies like the New York Times or the Washington Post, their bureaus that really were involved in investigative reporting have been reduced. The, the funding has been cut. Other entities that maybe, you know, cut their teeth or made their marks in investigative reporting have had to pull back from some of that because of the lack of funding. And where does that lead? That means that you have less support for those kind of journalists who are really interested in doing that kind of work 
and as opposed to people who can do the the really and some of it is really essential the the hard news cut and dry go out get it and then bring it back and put it on the air or put it online so you know some of that is uh financial in terms of the financial impact and why we don't have as much investigative reporting and some of that too is on the journalist are people going into journalism because they want to be stars themselves <laughs> Or are they willing to do the hard work of really going out and covering the stories and taking more time to do that? It's I See You. I'm Eddie Robinson. And that was media and film professor Sonia Williams of Howard University. We'll chat more with her in our next segment. But Professor Williams makes an interesting observation. Why do journalists decide to pursue media and broadcasting to begin with? And what happens when you combine two worlds of news coverage? That of the entertainment world, the glitz, the glamour, the gossip, and the concept of investigative journalism. Is this what media consumers really want? Our next guest decided to leave the typical TV assignment reporting arena and combine his passion for investigative journalism with the glitz and glam of entertainment news. His name is Justin Carter. He worked as a morning TV co-anchor in Springfield, Illinois, and also spent time working as a general assignment news reporter for several stations in upstate New York and the Pennsylvania area. He's now opted to work as a full-time investigative reporter for the website The Shade Room. Hey, what's up? My name is Angelica Wandu, and I'm the founder of The Shade Room. A Black-owned independent digital news platform that focuses on black culture, celebrity entertainment, beauty and fashion trends, and gossip. The site labels its audience not as users, viewers, or followers. They're called roommates. And the New York Times once called the Shade Room the TMZ of Instagram, as much of its news is reported primarily on Instagram. But you'll find news reports on Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, and other platforms as well. We spoke to Justin virtually from his home in Atlanta to learn more about his career and why he decided to leave TV news and work for The Shade Room. I'm Justin Carter. This is TSR Investigates. It just shocked me when I realized that people love the, the stories that I do. And, and I fought my boss so hard. My stories, they wanted they wanted them to be five to six minutes long. And mm-hmm. in TV news, that is just unheard of. Our, our stories are a minute and a half to two minutes. And the whole mm-hmm. idea behind that is people's attention spans aren't long enough to sit there and listen to my stories. But I think the the big thing is, is I think that our generation loves investigation and deep diving because we, we really are truth seekers. And I, I think that we just want to know the full scope of the story. And like you mentioned, too, I mean, I, I think that gone are the days. But it depends on the story. It does. Right? It depends on it the does. kind of story. Exactly. Exactly. And that's why I take a lot of time and pride on the stories that I pick, because I, I, I like these stories to I, I want them to resonate with people and I want people to connect with them. And so, you know, I, t- I take a lot of time trying to figure out what stories I do want to cover and want to investigate. I'm always to think in the back of my mind, it has to be visually stimulating. Mm -hmm. People like to see proof. So, you know, if I'm going to investigate a wig scammer, I need to see receipts that, you know, uh, from her victims. I need to see the pictures of these wigs that she's sending to people because people want to see that. People want to see, you know, what people are doing and they just want the truth at the end of the day. And I think that one of the big problems with TV, and I think they're starting to realize this, at least with TV news, I don't think people want to see a minute and a half of a shooting that happened across town or a minute and a half of a fire or an ac- a car accident. I think people want to see more than that. And so that's why, you know, I, I kind of chose this avenue because it gives me more freedom to, to deep dive into the issues that we believe are impacting the, the black community. And, you know, I think with investigative journalism. It's really advocacy. I'm advocating for people and I'm trying to, you know, just just get facts and help people at the end of the day. That's what it's all about. Coming up, more of our chat with multimedia journalist Justin Carter, who'll share insight into his transition from TV news 
to more of a fusion of social media and investigative reporting for the celebrity digital gossip site known as The Shade Room. We'll also chat more with Howard University professor Sonia Williams and find out what she thinks about how information should be filtered to the public by the media when there's an overwhelming amount of information that's so readily available for anyone's fingertips, especially as we grapple with the potential spreading of, quote, fake news and alternative facts. Be sure to share your own thoughts about the future of journalism. Send us your comments via email, talk at I-S-E-E-U-Show.org. I'm Eddie Robinson, and I see you. We'll be right back. It's ICU. I'm Eddie Robinson. We're speaking with Sonia Williams, author and Peabody Award winning radio producer, as well as professor of media and film over at Howard University. Ownership. You mentioned it a brief moment, you know, just earlier in our conversation. Does it matter who's at the steering wheel? And when I say that, I mean, you know, from a media ownership standpoint, sometimes certain forms of media can be disguised as objective, but there may be certain words that journalists use at those organizations, certain phrases are used that might signal something else entirely. You know, for instance, we had King Richard actress on Anjanue Ellis on our show, and she spoke at length, Professor, about the role and responsibility of media organizations, especially as it relates to, you know, sort of what went down January 6th last year, you know, with the insurrection how certain stations didn't want to call it an act of terrorism, uh, mainly in her mind because the event allegedly involved politicians in our own government. Even from media, you know, commentators, journalists, and what they say and how they ask certain questions to black or athletes of color, you know, it could be intense. And I can recall being so upset I remember when I worked at WNYC, Professor, at the time, and I saw these images on our wire services that would use these images of Venus and Serena during matches. US Open Women's Final. Serena Williams yeah. got into it with an umpire. In the most unflattering, distasteful action shots. I mean, it almost felt intentional. And I thought, editors, publishers, you know better. You know what you're doing. And you know that you know what you're doing. And so I'm curious to get your thoughts on, you know, from an ownership standpoint, you know, who holds the steering wheel of an organization, especially when we see how limited, you know, black owned media and that landscape looks like nowadays. So does it matter who's at the steering wheel? Ownership is key because I think that's why in the 70s, actually 60s and 70s, you had a push by black entrepreneurs to try to get ownership of radio stations. And then, you know, that push allowed several Black owners Mm -hmm. to purchase and then uh, run or or have it be Black-owned and operated radio stations. I think that Kathy Hughes, who our school is named after, first said, of course, you know, if you own, you control. And having control over media sources is really key because it affects what ends up going out into the world. So it's absolutely important. With more people turning to their phones and social media for news, you know, how do we make sure people are getting the right information? Should there be more of a gatekeeper or some sort of gatekeeping process of information? Well, there already are gatekeepers. I mean, that's in part, it's, it's the gatekeeper of, of ownership, who owns. That's it. And therefore determines what is going to be out there. But also the producers, whether they are broadcast producers or web producers or whether they're the journalists. I think that it really kind of gets back to the education of the creator 
If your primary goal to be in the media is to be a quote unquote star, then that's going to color everything that you do. But if you are in journalism in particular, to do what the First Amendment is, and that is present information and freedom of speech and all that. Yeah. And to try to present various sides of a story, then that's different. And I think that goes back to who it is that you are or that person is creating the content. There you go. Gatekeepers, they're, they're gatekeepers at different levels. It could be an editor. It could be a, a publisher. It could be the owner. So I don't know if you can have just one gatekeeper. Okay. But I think it does go back to who is creating the content, what is the content intended to do, and then obviously where is it going to end up. And and some of that also, of course, depends on who the owner of the media is and what they will allow to get out there. But again, we go back to what we talked about earlier. That's right. And that is in this world of the Internet. There you go. <laughs> You have a lot more access. Of course, just access, though, is not the be-all, end-all, because access is one thing. How do you then make sure that the audience you're intended that information for actually knows that it is there and then receives it? That's such a good point, especially when we talk about that DIY podcaster, right? You know, the (laughs) the do-it-yourself podcaster. Right where that information is just so abundant, so out there, who can gatekeep that information? In a post-Trump administration era of media, Professor, how do journalists and media professionals combat that narrative of fake news? Understanding the definition of what really is the truth. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that is the question, isn't it? <laughs> the book that I wrote called Word Warrior is about a pioneering uh, writer who was, he, he worked in all the mediums except for film, but he was a, a newspaper journalist. He was a radio dramatist. One of the things that really surprised me was just how versatile Richard Durham was as a writer. Uh, here's a man who was born in Mississippi uh, in 1917 and then his family. He also wrote for the Chicago Defender, and he wrote Muhammad Ali's autobiography. He was a speech writer. And I, the reason why I bring him up is because one of the things that he came to as a result of all his experiences from the 1930s through his death in the 1980s was that if you want information to get out there and to be not just consumed, but to be received and maybe even accepted by a populace or or a listening audience or reading audience, is that you have to present that information over and over again. Which is what, if you think about it, this whole fake news thing (laughs) has been. That's it. You know, from the president on down to his cronies, it's like, you say this, okay, you say it again, then you say it again, and then you say it again. Hearing it repeat. And the thing is that how do you present information so that it can be heard over and over again? And I think that's one of the things that in, in journalism schools that's happening now is that we, we talk about this whole thing about multimedia training sure. so that you don't train students or, or a budding young journalist to just work in one form. They have to know how to present a story for the ear, podcasting or radio. Right. They have to know how to write and present a story for visual television or the internet. They have to know how to present it via tweet (laughs) or some other online form. So I think that's part of the way of getting it out there. But again, you get back to what is the truth and all. And I, it kind of goes back again to the whole idea that journalism was technically designed to be objective. Objective can be, you can question what is objective. But it did mean presenting more than one side of the story, (laughs) several sides of the story, or or they would say, you know, the positive and the negative. Well, I think now it's even more imperative that the, the various sides of the story is presented, but 
you also, if you're going to talk about solutions journalism, it's like, okay, here is the issue or the problem. And then here are what other folks say could be a solution to that. And you do it over and over again in various mediums. And that way you can start to mitigate some of the quote unquote fake news that literally exist when you talk about things like this whole campaign against so-called CRT, as well as the election steal. It was scary as heck to be in Washington, D.C. Yeah. on January the 6th and hear planes flying overhead and sirens going. And, you know, we were all told, stay in your house, do not go out because wow. these folks are here. And again, that was part of that whole campaign. The election was stolen and they heard it both online and on in certain broadcast media. And it was something repeated over and over again. And then you had the January 6th result. So on the other side, I think you can present information that counters that and presents the quote unquote truth. But again, it has to be repeated over and over again, because I think the, the results of what happens when you have purely negative and false information repeated over and over again, people believe it. Some people believe it. It's I See You. I'm Eddie Robinson. And we've been exploring the question, what does the future of journalism look like? We've been speaking with acclaimed author and professor of media and film over at Howard University, Sonia Williams. And we've also been chatting with Justin Carter, a TV reporter now working as a senior multimedia journalist, where you can view his investigative reports on Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook for the website The Shade Room a black cultural entertainment gossip celebrity news platform that's based in Los Angeles and founded by entrepreneur Angelica Wandu. According to the site, it's reaching over 25 million across various social media platforms. I wanted to find out more from Justin about the kinds of followers who visit the Shade Room, and are they all Gen Z millennials? Yeah, there are people, all types of people. I mean... The 25 million people, they're, they're, they're men, they're women, they're all ages. I find that a lot of a lot of the Shade Room roommates are millennial women. Okay. But we still, I, I feel like there are so many different viewers or roommates out there that come from all different backgrounds. White people even follow the Shade Room. I have friends that follow the Shade Room that are white. And so, yeah, there's just so many people that follow it. And it's, it's just hard to put a specific, like person to it because you know it's starting to gain more and more pop popularity and okay. you know like i said i have a white reporter friend who i've been friends with for years who followed the shave room before i did and so it's like you know now it's just a big melting pot so tell us more about angelica wandu the woman who founded the shade room back in 2014 and why justin you decided to be a part of this platform the great thing about Angelica is she's gained so much popularity and she has just blossomed into the CEO of this major black media company. And I could just give her so much credit because she's my age. We're both young millennials and she's just doing doing the thing. And what I do like about her is that she is not afraid to put her money into something just to try it out. We, we've come out with several documentary style programs and uh, even reality shows have come out of the shade room within the yeah. last year. Welcome to Love Lock. Y'all ready to go in? Let's What's up, y'all? You know who it is, your fave Charmaine. I hooked up with the shade room and we decided to create something called Struggle Chef. She's just not afraid to rock the boat and she's not afraid to try new things and it doesn't matter how much money it costs. And what's the revenue outlet? You know, how are advertisers responding? Those kinds of questions there. This is not my department, so don't quote me. <laughs> yeah, I'm not in the ad world, but yeah, I think it just kind of works just like like TV, but just in the digital world. I mean, we okay. we have ads, we have clients that promote their products on not only the Instagram, which is the big money maker, it's where a lot of the viewers are, but you know, we have advertisers on the website. You know, we have YouTube that's monetized. And so, and we, and we have just relationships with our clients that, you know, we do projects on the side that generate money as well. We have, you know, projects with Facebook right now, developing content for Facebook. We have, we have a relationship with Cash App. So it's just one of those things where it's, it's, it's almost like TV advertisement. 
where, you know, it's just kind of in the digital space. It's ICU. I'm Eddie Robinson. And we're speaking with Justin Carter, an investigative reporter with The Shade Room. Uh, Justin, do you think journalism is a dying field? Is it losing its objectivity? I mean, are consumers becoming more attracted to that notion of access journalism? You know, that coverage that brings in audiences who are desperate to hear about celebrities and gossip. If an interviewer lands a cover story with, say, Beyonce or Barack Obama or even Donald Trump, do media consumers want that? Or do they even care for the real, deep dive, probing, fact-finding narratives, you know, earning that journalistic integrity yeah. versus the glitz, the glam, the celebrity access, the fame, you know, getting the sports news nuggets first before it's being officially announced. Has real journalism died or lost its integrity in a world where social media rules and the number of followers you have rules that world? Yeah. Yeah, well, first, I think it's so funny um, because when I was in college, I had a professor, one of my favorite professors said the most important thing about journalism is access. And that has always stuck with me. Access, access, access. That's what she told. That's what she taught us. And so I think it's a balance. I think you have to have access, but you also have to be fair and you have to hold people accountable all in the same breath. I don't think that journalism is dead at all. I think there's a shift. I think there's a shift with journalism and how we consume it. And I don't think that that means that it's dead. Literally, Eddie, these stories that I do every single Tuesday are exactly what I would do for a TV station. Okay. But I'm doing it in a digital medium now. And so I took a step back and I, I was scared to death when I started at the Shade Room because I was, for once, taking a risk and getting off of this train of going to a different TV market every two years after my contract ends. I was getting out of this train and into the digital world. And I just kind of, I wanted a change because I knew that there is this digital shift where people, more of my colleagues, more of people my age are consuming their news in a different way. That No longer are my peers, my colleagues staying up until 5 p.m. or 6 p.m. or 11 p.m. to watch the news when it's right here instantly. So I think my strategy and in the risk that I took, I wanted to ride this shift. And of course, we're all still learning. Not even the, the big TV sales executives know what's going to happen in the next 10, 15 years. But I felt like we are in a shift and I need to ride this shift in order yeah. to stay afloat. Because in 15 years from now, I don't think that TV news will be as big as it was in the 80s and 90s. You know, just everybody's getting information so quickly and, Digitally. you know, programming. It's like you have a four o'clock, five o'clock, six o'clock, 11 o'clock news. But like I said, I don't have to wait that long if it's on my phone or it's on my Twitter feed. That's that's really fascinating. And there's there's one question of is, you know, journalism dying. And that's that's an awesome response. But I think another question, I think in my mind, it's separate. Do you think journalism has lost its purpose? I think it is different. The purpose is different than what it was back in the day when, you know, news was at in its heyday. You know, you had the, the big, the big name. For the CBS evening news. Dan Rathers. Dan Rather reporting. Dan Rathers. Walter Cronkite. Old anchorman, you see, don't fade away. They just keep coming back for more. I think it has changed. And sometimes I look at those old newscasts and I'm like, wow, you know, no longer are these newscasts directed at getting solid information and just telling people the facts. I think now we're in a time where, again, we're visual people. I think millennials are visual people. Okay. So if it's not visually stimulating to us, we're not going to watch. And so that's what I think is different. It is kind of unfortunate, I think, Eddie, because... Sometimes journalists are after the glitz and glam. So a lot of times it drives journalists to say, oh, gotcha. You know, I, I chased after the bad guys just to get just to ask the gotcha question. And so I think a lot of times we're taught and I have been taught this, too. You know, we're, we're chasing after getting the best visual and not necessarily the hardcore solid facts. And I think that is what's changing within our world of journalism. Like I said, I just think it's about finding balance because if millennials like visual stuff, 
I can't give them stuff from back in the day. I have to ride with them because at the end of the day, they're not going to watch. And, you know, our jobs are on the line if people don't watch. So I think it's just a happy medium, finding a balance. And again, it's what I, I struggle with every week is how do I tell people information, but also grab them visually and grab them with my words and with the visuals. It's like a, a puzzle piece that I'm trying to to get every single week. And it just sometimes it drives me insane. I, in the middle of the night, I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to, you know, I'm based here in Atlanta, but how am I going to grab Keisha from Oklahoma City or, you know, you know, Shantae from Ohio, Cleveland, Ohio, or, you know, Dan in Philly. Like, how am I going to grab these these masses of people and tell a good story, uh, but also give them what they want, which is glitz and glam and something to, to look at? Why did the Shade Room felt that it was time for an investigative journalist? Yeah, I think, um, you know, like I said, with the whole George Floyd situation, and I think with, you know, things that are happening in our world, I think that people really value investigations and news, and they just want to see what's going on in their community. And so in that way, I think Angelica said, I think she evaluated how many people watched our George Floyd coverage. We sent a whole crew. This is before I worked there, but we sent a whole crew to Minneapolis to cover it. And she saw the numbers. She's a numbers girl. She's a CEO. So, you know, she's all about sure. numbers and what people like and, you know, how things are perceived on our platform. And so I think she saw that there is a craving for news and that is not going away from the from the viewers, from the roommates. And she she just said, we need someone to come in who knows how to tell a story, who knows hard news. We need somebody who can keep it real with people, but also tell people the facts because I think that this can be something big and this could take the shade room to the next level, you know, cover the hard news, but also give you the tea. We like to call it the tea. The tea. Yes. The tea and the shade as well. So it's just still becoming- tea. <laughs> I thought that I was old when I would mention that to people. It was like, is it tea still? Is it, uh-huh. is, is it piping high still, still tea? Sweet. Unsweet. Still- <laughs> <laughs> yes, but, you know, I think she's just trying to take the shade room yeah. to the next level. And I think Got news it. is a part of that. That's right. And she realized, yeah, you, know, you kind of said it too, but she realized that it depends on how that story is told and who's telling it with a certain voice, with a certain knack, with a certain flair. And you don't find that voice on NBC or ABC or any, you know, it has to come from a voice that she, and, and I'm just thinking, I don't know, I'm putting words in my mind of what she's thinking, but it's like, she wants to know how that story is going to be told through lens of her roommates, you know, to see what, how they would react. And, and I think those kinds of platforms are so limited and we don't see, <laughs> see our voice anymore. You know, we don't see those platforms existing. And here she has a winning strategy to say, look, this is the shade room. And as a result of this incredible incident with Ahmaud Aubrey, it's a case that gripped the nation last year. It's now in the spotlight once again. The three white men accused of killing Ahmaud Aubrey getting their day in court. Brianna Taylor's of the world. Let's now finally have some sort of investigative edge and be able to tell those stories with our own shade room voices. Exactly. And I think that's really cool of what she's doing and what you're doing as well. Thank you. Yeah, and it's the first time, you know, I think it's the first time we were doing something like this, but it's also the first time for our roommates to see other roommates are on our platform. And go. it's like, okay, you know, I'm used to seeing people in the comments, but now we're seeing people face to face and I'm just giving people a platform to tell their stories because, you know, I'm sure you're in this industry. People like to see other people. We like to see ourselves on, right. on camera. We like to see raw emotion. And so I'm just giving that edge as well, just to give people an idea of what the roommates look like, what they're going through. And people I think are entertained by that, I think. And not only that, they're engaged because I noticed your comment where you said that you read comments. Just think if, you know, if we were relying on TV and, you know, TV news, how effective would that be if 
comments would be thrown at anchors, you know, and reporters instantaneously while they're, you know, doing their field reporting. All of a sudden, you've got these comments coming from the audience saying, what the hell are you doing? What are you talking about? <laughs> um, but now you've got this digital sort of realm of engagement and roommates, audiences, they can really sort of dictate, not dictate, that's probably the worst word you could use, but they could also just kind of give you some quick feedback. And perhaps it's negative, perhaps it's even positive, perhaps it's even motivational and inspiring, but at least you've got some sort of engagement that's going on with your roommate and the digital platform so that you could still, for the next time a story needs to be told, you still have that engagement and that voice and those people act reacting. Um, Absolutely. And it's, and it's, it's so funny too, because people are, I have maybe 300 comments or 300 people in my inbox right now telling me their stories and wanting me to investigate. Wow. And I'm like, I go. think I need a team because I need, or I need an assignment manager because yeah. I cannot read. It will take me days to read 300 comments and, you know, look into people's, you know, horror stories or they're scam- they were scammed. As soon as I do a scam story, especially people are like, well, I was scammed by, you know, you know, sure. moop, moop. like, you know, sure. so. <laughs> and the stories. So, yeah. So, yeah, it's very interesting that, yeah. um, you know, I have this platform to give people. I- I'm just lucky because I'm, I'm giving people a platform tw- with millions of people to tell their story. And, you know, I just think it's being received well and people like to see what other people are going through. And, you know, I think it's, again, it's advocacy at the end of the day. Justin Branker Carter, theshaderoom.com. Thanks enormously. Yes. I really appreciate this. Thank you so much for being a guest on IC. Of course, Eddie. Thank you for having me. And IC would also like to thank author, producer, and professor of media and film at Howard University, Sonia Williams, for being a guest on our show. Our team includes technical director Todd Holslander, producer Laura Burks, editors Mark DeClaudio and John Mitchell Good, sound designer Dave McDermott. ICU is a production of Houston Public Media. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter. And for more updates and episodes, visit our website, iseeushow.org. I'm your host and executive producer, Eddie Robinson. Thanks so much for listening. And remember, I feel you, we hear you, I see you. Until next time.